Hi, everyone, and welcome to our second, our part two uh, series, um, We Come From the Stars. We're really excited to be having this, continuing this conversation, um, and we hope to continue to over the next few coming weeks as well. This uh, webinar is being hosted by uh, the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit Education Association of Ontario in partnership with uh, the Math Knowledge Network. Um, this is part of our bigger project of looking at Indigenous knowledge systems and uh, mathematics, as well as other areas of science, technology, and engineering. Uh, we are a subject association, uh, and the work that we do is guided um, by an elders advisory council. And that council is made up of uh, language, fluent language speakers. Um, many are former residential school survivors. And the work that we do together is to try and advance Indigenous education across the province of Ontario um, and make those necessary changes that are slowly starting to happen now uh, in the education system. And so we want everyone to experience the rich, uh, diverse, and incredible knowledge systems that Indigenous peoples uh, carry and have to offer. And so I'm going to turn it over now to our host um, for the series and she's going to introduce herself and we will uh, get started shortly. Hi everybody. Um, my name is uh, Karen Recolet. I'm an urban Cree um, human. And I'm very excited about this gathering. Um, thank you to all the folks that are already um, acknowledging your presence here. We have Manitoulin Island, um, Maryland. We've got people from all over and it's beautiful. This is a beautiful time to gather um, in, this, in this moment in time. Um, we decided that tonight would be um, conversation. It will be talking about the in-between spaces, the dark matter, um, and really showing um, ethics of care and what, what care looks like in, in digital spaces. If there's one thing that I've learned by, um, by having these conversations with Carlos and Isaac and Jody and Priya and others, is this beautiful ethic of relationality that exists and, um, and surpasses and extends into digital space. So we welcome you tonight. Um, we welcome you know, your families. We're grateful for all of the care that you're providing to your families at this time. And we hope to mimic those same forms of care um, within uh, this way as well. So um, I'm not going to say too much. Um, I know that you're all anxious to um, listen to these incredible rich knowledge holders. Um, I'm looking forward to this moment of like perhaps a deep listening um, to really like thinking about almost like wintertime story time practices, you know, of just like listening deeply and 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 creating within the between spaces of a conversation between knowledge holders. So I'm looking forward to this. I know you're looking forward to this. Um, and uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, the, the, the speakers tonight. So first one is um, Isaac Murdoch. And um, what I'm gonna give you is a very brief intro. Um, and then I will ask Isaac also to introduce himself. I will also be introducing Carlos, and we'll be asking um, Carlos to introduce yourself as well. Um, so welcome. Uh, I'd like to introduce Isaac Murdoch. Isaac is from the Serpent River uh, First Nation, and he is Fish Clan. He has spent years living in the bush as a trapper, a wild rice harvester, a maple syrup maker, and a hunter. Um, he knows so much about like pictographs, about stars and celestial knowledges, um, radical relationality, thinking in the future about kinship and community. Um, and I really appreciate the way in which he offers these knowledges into the worlds for us. Um, so Isaac, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Karen, for the introduction. 
Man's in Apkina Gago and Abbe and Dishna Kaz, Kennebe Guk, Shabika Ajwat and Don Jaba, Gnoje and Do Dem. My name is Isaac Murdoch. I'm from Serpent River First Nation, and it's a great honor to be here. I currently reside at a place called Nimki Ajbikong, which is our cultural camp um, forever that's located north of Elliott Lake in Anishinaabek uh, Aking. Aho miigwech. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Hi. <laughs> I'd also like to introduce you to Juan Carlos. Um, Juan Carlos Chave was, was born and raised in the Yaqui Sonora territories of the American Southwest. Um, he earned a bachelor's and master's and PhD in information science from the U University of Washington in Seattle. Um, his area of research is information poverty and bridging the digital divide. And he currently works at NASA Astrobiology Program Education Affiliate and has directed NASA funded STEM initiatives also focused on American Indians and Alaska Natives. And I am just getting to know you, Carlos, but from our brief conversations that we've had, I am so looking forward to other conversations. I think you, as well as all of the team here, are quite beautiful and brilliant. And um, I look forward to experiencing this uh, and witnessing this with you tonight. Um, is there anything that you'd like to say in terms of introducing yourself, Carlos? Uh, just to uh, give a, a traditional uh, introduction, a uh, brief Liosim Chaniavu, Hem Kwat Lipiri. My name is Kwati for short. It means uh, a guard, like a guardian and warrior. So just so you all know my indigenous name. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. So, um, Isaac. Um, Maybe we'll start with, with you. Is there, um, I'm interested in some of the things that you're thinking about right now um, in terms of our relationships to the celestial. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's your time to shine. <laughs> Tell us some stories, <laughs> Isaac. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Karen. <laughs> um, first off, I just want to, uh, to, to just to say that this is a great opportunity um, you know, to be able to work with, uh, with Karen and, and Carlos, of course, and Corrine and Priya and, you know, of course, Jody and everybody else. So it's, this is really, really amazing. Um, I really appreciate being here. I guess when we, me and Carlos talked uh, a few times on the phone and we, we start to talk about the sun and how important that is to our lives. And so I kind of want to talk a little bit about about the Anishinaabeg philosophy about the sun and why it's so important in our ceremonies and our way of life. And of course, everything starts with a story. So I will, I will tell the story. Um, they say that we come from a place up in the stars. We come from there and that we were lowered down here. And they say that the story of our birth, you know, we come from a place way in the west, in the stars. And we travel through four powers to get here. And of course, through each power, we learn the sacred laws of this earth. And of course, that's land, fire, air, water. And we learn those before we come here as babies. And then we, we of course, we enter this world through our mother's sacred hoop. And then we enter the sacred lodge here on earth. And, you know, a long time ago, our people used to live in, in wigwams, like the Ojibwe people lived in wigwams. And they believed that the lodges themselves were connected celestially to the stars. And a lot of them were aligned from east to west. It's the same way that we're buried. We're, we're buried uh, with our feet facing west. And so our lodges, the doors would face east. So when the sun comes up in the morning, the sun would bring its power into our homes. And of course, when the sun travels during the day, you know, we follow that sun, we work, we don't take a step back. And when you look at the sun, the sun never stops, it just keeps going. And so, you know, we were taught as children that we have to, to be like that, that we have to work, we have to keep busy during the day like the sun and because there's lots to do in the bush. Um, 
and that our lodges are celestially connected to those stars. And so they understood the importance of those lodges. And when you look at some of the lodges, the poles, the pitch, the, the angle that the poles are being pointed are hitting certain stars at certain times a year. And it was done on purpose because they believe that the, the star world, you know, is, is a map of how we live here on earth. It's a, it's a beautiful map. And all of the original instructions on how to live here on earth is coded in all of those Muslim those sacred pictures in the sky. And they say that, you know, those are sacred sites. We have many sacred sites that are hanging above us. And those sacred sites, we, we have access to them through our lodges, through our ceremonies, through our prayers, by looking at them, acknowledging them. And, you know, the old people used to say, if you really love something up there, adopt it into your family. You know, give offerings to it. Invite it to be a part of your family and to your home. And so, you know, growing up, I was constantly staring at the stars, trying to find falling stars, of course, and comets and, and UFOs, um, you know, and trying to, to understand them a little bit more. And so I know that there's a story about our, our, one of our lodges, our Wabnoan Lodge, which is, happens on the longest day of the year. And I'm going to tell this short story before I hand it over to Carlos, who also has many beautiful stories to tell. Um, they say that a long time ago, that there used to be this lodge, a Wabano Lodge, on the longest day of the year. It faced east to west, and the door was in the east. And in that lodge, you know, the people would sing their songs. They would celebrate the new life that was coming, the new cycle. And of course, this was their time to give offerings to each other. This was their time to give and share and to celebrate, you know, the beautiful sun and the life that it gives everything. Our people know that the sun shines on the plant and the, the moose eats the plant and we eat the moose and we go back into the ground and we become a plant and, you know, like everything's all connected. And so we understand that this life, this, this lodge here on earth, is a gift. And so during the longest day of the year, when the sun is at its, at its strongest, that's when we celebrate that power. And they say many years ago, our people would practice this, this lodge ceremony, but they lost their way. And it started with a greedy man. There was this great big greedy man in that lodge and nobody knows why but he, he started to take it take control over it and he was a big man he had real big hands too they say his fingers were as big as smokies they were big and nobody could outpower him and nobody could could uh say anything and so he told everybody in that lodge nobody's to talk nobody's to sing nobody's to pray and so people over time, they just assumed that that's how it was in that lodge. And of course, that wasn't right because, you know, all of our laws, you know, are recited in that sacred lodge. And the lodge represents, you know, so much to us. It represents creation and life. And of course, this, this bad man, he, he just bullied everybody. And this went on for many years. Somebody in the village had a sick brother. And she thought, you know what? I'm going to bring my brother down to this lodge, the sacred lodge. And I'm going to see if they can pray for him and sing for him and dance for him and try to bring him back to life because he's dying. He's, he's turning gray. But of course, when she got to the door of that lodge, that, that greedy man at the doorway that big man, he said, what are you doing here? Don't bring him here. Get him out of here. She says, well, I thought that this is a, 
a lodge of life. He says, you got it all wrong. That was all fake. There's nothing like that. There's nothing real in this world. Go take your dying brother somewhere else. When she looked inside that lodge, she couldn't believe it. There was just bones lying everywhere. There was bones lying. You know, people were stepping over those bones. That's, you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to do that. Step over bones like that. And the meat was just rotting. It just stunk inside there. And it was because of that man. He, he, he just, he let everything go out of control. And he liked it like that. And she looked at inside that lodge. And she says, I want my brother. He's dying to come in here. And he's coming in here whether you like it or not. And she drug him inside that lodge. And she says, I want you to sing and pray for him. But that man, he said, nope. And they just watched him in the middle of that lodge, right in the center. He just laid there, dying. He was going gray, gray. So finally she took off crying. She says, I'm gonna go look for some help. She took off out of that Wabano lodge. She started running up the hill. She started to ask everything in the forest. My brother's dying. Our people have lost their way. And, and I want him to live. I'm looking for an extension of his life. And of course she asked the rocks, can you help my brother? She asked the flowers, can you help him? She asked the plants, there was clouds coming by. She, she screamed at those clouds, help my brother. Somebody help my brother. But there was no answer at that time. She seen this great big wigwa stick, this big birch tree. And she thought, you know what, I'm gonna cut down this, this bark off this birch tree. And I'm going to cut a big strip off of it. And I'm going to take it down to that lodge. And I'm going to wrap my brother up in that birch bark. Because he's going to die. And then I'll bury him like that. Right when she started to cut that birch tree, she seen a white rabbit. This rabbit was unusually white. Because on the longest day of the year, the rabbits turn color. They go from white to brown. But that rabbit was white. And of course, in our way, a white animal like that is very sacred. Even people, if you see somebody like that, and they're just white, they have white hair, everything is white about them. That's a very sacred person. But anyway, she looked at that rabbit. She says, can you help my brother? He's dying. And that rabbit just blinked at her and didn't say anything. Oh, she was heartbroken. She thought that the world had given up on the people. And so she cut that birch bark down and she got some wiggle, some, some rope. And she tied, she rolled up that birch bark and she tied it on her back. And she went down that hill into that lodge. As soon as she got to that lodge, that big man was there. And that man said, what are you doing here? She said, mind your business. You know, you, you, you're being mean. And you don't know the true meaning of this lodge. And my brother is sick and I brought him the sacred, the sacred blanket from the tree of life. I brought him this blanket so that he can rest well. He's going to die. Have a little bit of respect. That big man, he just, he didn't even say nothing. He just kept eating his, his uh, bone. Just mad. And she wrapped her, her dying brother up in that birch bark, right in the middle of that big lodge, that big wigwam. Everybody stared. Nobody said nothing. All of a sudden... Somebody said, hey, somebody's coming. And they looked. And there was a man at the door. 
he had two great big feathers sticking up from his his head. You know, like those real deadly, fancy eagle feathers with the black tips? He had those. And his suit was beautiful. It was all quilled. It had the stars. It quilled all over his, all over his suit. His face was painted. His, his body was covered with beautiful tattoos, Ozaswanan. He was a beautiful man, like me. <laughs> anyway, he came to the door. And right away, that greedy man looked at him and said, you can't enter this lodge. And he said, why not? He said, because you're, you're weak. If you can prove to me that your power is stronger than mine, then I'll let you in here. So of course, the, that, that strange man at the door, he jumped. But when he jumped, he jumped really high, much higher than the lodge, much higher than a deer or an antelope. He jumped real high, far into the sky. Everybody was amazed at how high he jumped. And when he landed, he, he, when he hit the ground, you could hear thunder in the ground. You could hear thunder crashing. They knew that that person was Manado, was a spirit. And of course, the greedy man at the doorway, that mean man, he just put his head down. He knew that his power wasn't greater than his. And of course, the spirit walked in the lodge and said, there's a, there's a, a very sick person here. We must sing for this person. We must dance for this person to restore life. We need to have the drum in here, the heartbeat of this land. We need to have the voices of the people come through our hearts and out our mouths and into the world to petition for help. We need to have the, the shkode, the fire here, because our, that means your ancestors will be right there to help. That fire, Shkode Nene, will help. He says, you've lost your way. And, and we knew this was going to happen. And so what we're going to do is we're going to clean this lodge. He says, I want you to, to, to know my brother, the wolf. All of a sudden, somebody said, look, there's something else at the door. All of a sudden, this wolf came, this beautiful black wolf it came running into the lodge and it jumped over that dying man and a spark from its tail came spiraling out and it landed right into that man's mouth right in his mouth it went all the way into his mouth all the way down to where that man's heart was as soon as that spark got there, it was instant. That person's life was restored. And of course, this, this spirit said, all my friend here requires is the offering of bones and fat. And that wolf started to eat all of the bones that were on the lodge floor. It was happy. Those offerings were good enough. And that, that spirit told the people, the woman reminded you how this lodge was to be. But for some reason, that man over there, he's the one that misdirected everybody in the wrong way. And it happens. So we're going to learn everything all over again. The songs the dances, the ceremonies, the fire. We're going to learn it all. Why all these poles are pointed in the direction that they're pointed. I'm going to teach you why this lodge is connected to the stars. And I'm going to teach you about the power of the sun. So that you'll know how to live right with the original instructions that you were given a long time ago. 
And of course, that spirit spent many days with the people, showing them the songs, showing them everything. But while he was doing it, while he was teaching everybody, guess what? He took one of those bones, those sharp moose bones, and you know the bark that was used to, to roll up the dying man? He rolled that bark out and he started to draw everything about that lodge on that bark. All of the songs were there. All of the dances were there. How the lodge was to be set up. All the teachings about the sun. They were all there. Everything was there. And he rolled it up. And when he, when he held it, it had a heartbeat. And what he said was this. He says, that greedy man at the doorway will look after this. He lost his way, but his, I can still see that he has somewhat of a good heart inside. This heartbeat will help him and cure him of his sickness. And he handed that over to that, that greedy man. And of course, that heartbeat, he could feel it in that roll of birch bark with all those pictures. He could feel that birch bark just pulsating. And he started to cry. He says, I lost my way. He says, and my mother, my grandmother, my sisters, my daughters, they all tried to tell me, but I didn't listen. He says, and I, and I, I lost my way, but now I'm, I've been healed through knowledge of the stars. I've been healed through those great that, that great blanket that hangs up in the sky. And of course, that spirit said, you know, my brother the wolf, as an offering to this lodge and to you people, will live here with you. And all it needs is those bones, that fat. That's all it, that's all it wants. And it, it'll stay here, and it'll guard that eastern doorway so that that bad will never come back in again. And that wolf stayed with the people. It never left us. That's the dog, the reserved dog. Those dogs, those reserved dogs, those are not mutts. Those are sacred dogs. They know our ceremonies. They know our language, our medicines. Those dogs can read the stars. Those dogs are knowledge keepers. They're very sacred. They all come from that wolf. Every one of them. That black wolf is their chief. And then as he was leaving, you know, people started to cry. They said, they told that Marado, don't leave, don't leave. Stay. He says, I have to go. I have to go because there's lots of things I have to do. And of course that, that spirit left. Everybody ran to the door to go see. But guess what? He was gone. He was gone. But all they seen was a little white rabbit bouncing up that hill towards the sun. That that lady, her prayers were, were answered. That little rabbit came. And in my belief, we know that being to be somebody called Nana Bujo. And I can, I can say that because it's winter where I am. There's still snow where I am. Usually we, we don't talk about Nana Bujo when there's no snow. But it's, there's still snow where I come from, where I am. And so our people were reminded of those original instructions of our lodges and how they're connected to the stars. And as a child, I remember seeing them being built. My mother, she sent me off to go live with people. 
She says, you're not going to do good in school because you're too fidgety. You need to be in the bush. So I was taken out of school and I went to go live with these, these lodge people. And what they would do is at nighttime, they would calculate with their hands where the stars were above the tr certain trees. And during the day, they'd use their hands to measure, remeasure. And so during the day, they knew exactly where the stars were by using their hand. And then after a while, it was, you could do it by memory. So even during the daytime, you can look up and say, that's where that's, where that's going to be. And that's how disciplined and well our, uh, how high knowledge our people had. They used the stars as a way to to govern themselves here on earth. And for thousands of years, our people, of course, kept these lands pure and clean. They knew about sustainable economy. They had such a high education that they understood the ecological code on how to live here on earth. And it was coded in those lodges, it was coded with our mothers, and it was coded in those stars. And so our people were completely engulfed with celestial knowledge all the time. And that's how they were able to live their life here. And our governance systems, of course, were led by, by the animals. And the animals are stargazers. The fish are stargazers. And so we always lived our lives on those animal trails. We always lived our lives because we know that those trails are the same trails that are up in the sky. You know, one time I got sick and I was, I was told, you're going to eat a footprint. I'm like, what? A footprint? Because I always heard stories about our people eating moccasins during hard times. But a footprint? I was sick. And what that old lady did was she took a, a little bit of, of birch bark and there was an animal print in the bush and she scraped that animal print off. It was dirt. And she made me eat it. And she said, these animals are kept, a lot of them come from up there. That power is going to come down and it's going to, it's going to help you. It's going to help your mind. That's what she told me. So I ate that footprint. And you know what? I was a lot better. So I believe that, you know, there's lots of knowledge. There's lots of cultures. Diversity is important. Every tribe, every race of people on the earth have something incredible to share. It's almost like everybody has another piece of the puzzle. And so the more diversity that we have, the more that we can help each other out. You know, just like nature or the stars, there's so much diversity in there. When you look at a forest, everything in the forest has its place because everything helps everything else. And I was told that's how we're supposed to live. When you look up at the sky, it's the same way. All those stories are there. Everything is there. Sometimes we think that it's lost, but it's not. It's all there. When we put our people to fast, when we go to ceremony, when we, when we share with each other and learn from each other, all those things come back. Nothing is lost. And, you know, there's nothing greater than, than giving. Giving everything to everything, the same way that a river does or the same way that the sun does. That's all it does. All during the day, the sun just gives, its, gives life to everything. To everything. Every human being, every plant, every animal. Not just to Anishinaabe. We're not better than it. We don't deserve more sunlight than anybody else. We're all the same. Everybody's the same. And that's something that the sun teaches us is that we're, we're all humble 
and we're all dependent on this great life force, this mystery that's here. And so with that, I will, I will stop there. Um, I, I get excited. So um, thank you very much for listening to me. And I think at this time, I'd like to just pass, pass this uh, cyberspace uh, to the next one. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. Miigwech, thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Um, so, so much there. I mean, thinking about like trees as technologies to code atmosphere and in relationship with stars, um, this, the governance structure of stars, um, so beautiful. And one thing I was thinking about is that we're, we're always in a series of processions of traveling, of following old trails. And these processions are terrestrial, but they're also mimicking the celestial processions as well. Um, I, so much there, thank you. Carlos, I'd like to uh, open up this moment um, for you to share some thoughts in, um, in, our, in our digital space as we show care for each other and we hold space for each other in this moment. Well, thank you and thank you all for the opportunity to have this conversation. One of the lessons that my grandfather taught me was uh, humility and service and strength. And so with that, you know, I honor all of you for undertaking this digital space and for showing care and love and connection to each other and Isaac, my brother, for sharing such knowledge, such story tellings as uh, we were taught. Um, that really resonate and connect with all the different pieces that uh, we as an entity, as an organism, as an energy field uh, feel. Um, so I would like to acknowledge all of you. So thank you all for joining us and for the facilitators and for all the people that put effort and time into this. Um, and I would like to share a multiple connections as we say we're inter-tribal right now. And I think that we all have different you know, connections and communities but they're the same. So with that, I would share an elder's quote. Um, this elder, for, uh, he's an Alaskan native. He said, so with community, everybody's got a gift. We're taught that you need to honor that gift. If you don't use it, the creator is going to take that gift away. Whether it's your voice or speaking from the heart or whether you're a cook or a hunter, those are gifts the creator gave you to help your people. And I say that one in connection to this gathering. As we gather, you know, they, uh, my brother Isaac a Jr. said that animals, um, there's a governance, there's a connection to the animal kingdom. And another elder said that we've been taught that if you thank salmon for giving up its life to you, you thank the deer, the elk for giving its life so you could survive, you'll always be successful because the resource allows itself to be caught so that we can be successful and pay respect to it. So I start with those two quotes from these elders because this was, re, uh, it came to me that um, this conversation was about respect and we're talking about stars, the universe, but it's also respecting our traditions and our ways of being. And so that's why I started with those pieces. Um, and with that, um, I will talk a little bit about the sun uh, we talk about stars, but our, our solar system has one star. It's the sun. So that star is what I would like to share a little bit of background about in my traditions and in the traditions of the Southwest. And uh, we never saw borders. Uh, so for our communities, there was no Brazil, there was no Mexico, there was no United States or Canada. It was all us. We bartered and traded. We went on canoe journeys together. We walked, we used animals we shared. Um, so those were our ways and those ways were taken from us. And so we are now reclaiming and revitalizing our ways together through this medium by having these conversations and not questioning each other uh, originality or cards or blood quantums or names. We are sharing in an intertribal way in a good way. So let me uh, delve into the, the story that's a telling connected to the way that the sun came to be our star. So I will read a little bit and then I will share um, a little bit more. So essentially this, this teaching is that there were five worlds with five suns created one after another. 
So the, the actual uh, sun had earth, fire, air, water, and rock. Those were the components uh, of these particular worlds. The first world you know, was destroyed because its people acted wrongfully. Um, and so they were devoured by ocelots and their son also died. So now we have four worlds. The second son was the pure orb and saw its human beings uh, be transformed into monkeys because they lacked the wisdom uh, to listen and to be engaged. The next um, came the son of the fire whose world was destroyed by flames, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions because the people were not living in a pious way. They were not humble. They did not sacrifice to the gods. And the gods we translate to mean um, the, these entities that are spirits. The fourth world perished in a great flood, which also drowned its son. And before the dawn of the fifth, if you will, um, the gods assembled together in the darkness to decide how are we going to save this star? How are we going to save this sun? And so with that, they came together and they created a great fire. And with that great fire, they invited uh, people to actually go into the fire and sacrifice themselves so that the, that fire can turn into a star and a sun. And it was light up the world. It's the way that it's loosely translated. And so we had various people that felt that they could do that, that they could go in there because they did it because they felt that they were going to be acknowledged. And so one of the actual uh, ancestors dressed themselves in hummingbird feathers and jewels and gold and turquoise. And these ancestors told him, jump into this fire. You will ascend up and become our star. Well, this ancestor had a difficult time. Four times he tried to go into the fire, but could not. And so from the audience came the lowliest of all of the ancestors. His name is Nanat Sin. And he was dressed in humble garments, woven reeds. He was ugly, misshapen, covered with scabs. And he offered to sacrifice himself into this fire. And so loosely translated in the English language, he would be called the scabby one. And so the ancestors asked him to jump into this fire and become our son. And without hesitation, Nano Tsin jumped into that fire and ascended to become this, this son. And out of shame, the other ancestor jumped in as well. And through that, the sun is now part of our solar system because of the sacrifice. And so these teachings are from what some uh, English languages call the Mesoamerican um, geographies. Uh, we don't believe in those kinds of geographies. We believe we're all interconnected. And this sun is, connects us all. This star brings us together. This solar system moves with the sun. The sun directs and we transition. So as we do this, we bring these pieces together in an interconnected way, intertribally, and focus on what this means for us. And so as we think about the sun, we think about an energy field. If you've ever gone anywhere and seen pictures, our traditions show us never to look at the sun, but to look down from the sun for various reasons. Uh, but in our traditions, when there is, for example, a solar eclipse, we are not to see it because that's when grandmother moon and grandfather sun make passionate love and create the corona or these, the, the crown around it. And I know that word has been given a negative connotation, but that is not, that is a word that also means passion. So we have these traditions of the sun and grandmother moon that teach us that, you know, everything is energy, everything is connected. And so if we think about it at the smaller scale, the heart, our heart, if you put your hand on your heart, and just leave it there for a second, you will be feeling the most powerful source of electromagnetic energy the human body can produce rhythmically. It is 60 times greater 
than your brain's activity. So when someone says you need to think, what they should be saying to us is you need to feel. Because as indigenous, we feel the energy field. When we come in proximity to somebody, we feel their energy. And as a, as you know, I'm, I'm in ceremony right now with this conversation, but have you ever walked up to somebody and felt an energy or like, wow, that person is super sweet. I really want to just give them a hug. And have you ever walked somewhere close to somebody and say, wow, I don't know if I'm, if I'm safe for that person. That is because we're exuding these electromagnetic energies constantly. So the next time someone says, you need to think, as an indigenous person, what they're saying to us, we need to feel. And that is why trust for us is very difficult to attain because we feel your energy field. And it comes from the sun, the star. The star has electromagnetic spectrum. And what that means essentially is that it produces these waves. And these waves are called radio. They're called microwaves, infrared, ultraviolet, x-ray, gamma ray. While these words are not our words, these are not words that we use when we tell our stories and when we teach our children how to live with this vast universe and with this particular beautiful Mother Earth. These are the words that have been brought in to describe what we already know to be true, which is we are creatures of the heart, all of us. And so with that, we bring together this, this concept of connectivity, of connection. So when we look on our journey, this joint journey that we have, we know that there is this star and the star in itself produces energy and our heart is a, it produces energy. So when we see the mountains and we see these giants and we experience their vastness and their energies, we have emotional responses to that. And we are taught that it's not okay to shed tears when we see these giants. It is not okay to feel sad when we see our trees passing. And I'm going to tell a little story on that. I uh, moved into a location in proximity to a tribe. Um, they're called the Muckleshoot Tribe and in Washington State, which is the state that's right below Vancouver, BC. And I planted that willow um, got it on a super sale. It was like, I think like $2 or something. And it was, you know, off season. And, you know, I was raised by my grandfather to always caretake for anything that has a possibility to live. So I grabbed this small little stick of a, a weeping willow and I put it in the backyard and I caretake for it. I would pray with it. I would, I would ask for blessings for it. And it blew, grew into this magnificent canopy, this beautiful, heavy trunk. This beautiful, we call them women, so um, that's our tradition. This beautiful woman, this mother, uh, provided beautiful shade, and it just showed these beautiful branches. And this year, beetles, the boring beetles, came in and lived and ate and continued to eat, and it's, it's now crying. It's ready to move on to its next part of its journey. And I tell this story because... We were, I was taught, I should say, that, you know, men don't cry. I was taught that boys don't cry. I was taught that we are not allowed to feel. We think. We're engineers. We're scientists. We're physicists. We describe formulas, you know, sign of 2 pi over t, the frequencies, you know, all of these things. Well, we can do those things. The power of our people is that we feel. And because of that, our elders are reminding us that we need to continue to feel the get, you know, these rays that are coming at us, these radio frequencies, these microwaves, all of those things are bouncing off our brain. And so as you, when you use a, se a cell phone, it's on cellular signal, right? Sometimes you have disruptions. And these disruptions can be caused because satellites are impacted by solar flares. These explosions that protrude from our grandfather's sun disrupt the signaling from these satellites to us down here on Mother Earth. And for us, we're taught that when those quote-unquote disruptions of our YouTube videos or of our Zoom calls or of our talking with our friends or social media and 
when that meme didn't go through of the, you know, the dog tripping over a bowl or something. And when those disruptions happen, what we're really being told is be mindful that you're supposed to be present. Be mindful you're supposed to be here now. You're not supposed to be on these devices when you have a human next to you. And this pandemic has highlighted the fact that as togetherness, we are sharing this energy field and that is required. And so when we are together, our hearts are beating for each other. But that energy field, that magnetic, that electromagnetic spectrum is brought down from the grandfather sun and grandmother moon. It's brought together by our hearts that are beating in proximity. So being mindful of where we are, where we are, is what we were taught as very young children. Learning to shed these tears, learning to feel, is something that we are all still striving to do. And in today's society, our children are having difficulty having conversations because they text each other if they're literally a block away from each other instead of coming together and sharing the stories and the knowledge that, we, that are given to our grandparents, our parents. So these devices, these electro, uh, electronic devices are so connected to these devices that are up in space, in outer space and near space, that sometimes we don't listen to the message that the messengers are giving us. Birds, these are messengers. These messengers taught us how to fly. Lift, drag, all of these terms are engineering terms that these planes um, apply to actually get a you know, weight, to get it up into you know, the, the actual Father Sky area. And so that the question then becomes is, as we talk about stars, as we talk about we are made of stars, it, wouldn't it be true that our grandparents are more closely aligned to those stars and they're sharing that energy field with us so that we can become those grandparents? Isn't it true that it is our responsibility to listen? As our elders taught us, we have two ears and one mouth. And then to take those pieces and connect them to other in an intertribal way, in an interrelational way. And as we uh, start to really bring together these notions of what is ultraviolet and what's an X-ray and you know, gamma rays and how dangerous they are and, and all of these things, and, and you know, the speak of science and how science is, can be scary, and how engineering can be scary and math can be scary. The thing is our elders taught us math already. We just didn't listen as well. I didn't listen as well. And what I mean by that is we are, when some of us go to school, we were taught that we can't use our hands to count. One, two, three. That's somebody who can't do it in their head because they can't think. But again, we feel when we touch our fingers, we feel, we can just feel ourselves. And this registers right here because it registers in our heart, because we change the frequency within our own bodies by putting that pressure into ourselves. So when others are celebrated for their medicine, you know, in, in, in just to share a piece, you know, some people say, some traditions say that when you take your hand and you go to the window of your soul and you squeeze that your head, the pressure will release. So why is that? And that is because, again, you know, we are creatures of energy and love, and we ourselves can heal ourselves if we take the time to listen to the tellings of the cosmos, of the spectrum of energy that exists within us. And so with that, I'd like to share a small video um, that I've asked uh, my sister Jody to show. And as the video plays um, and there's uh, silence, I, I will speak a little bit about it. What I like to do is just preface it by saying, this is one way that um, in my previous work, I did an activity that I did to exhibit how we are so aligned um, to something bigger. Um, so take a look here. This is Warm Springs Tribe from Oregon. And that state is right below the state of Washington, which is, as I mentioned, Washington is right below Vancouver, BC. So Jody, if you could play it for, I'd appreciate it. Up here.
So you are watching a high altitude balloon deploy, or otherwise known as weather balloon. Jody, if you can mute while I speak um, and just keep the video playing, um, I could describe a little more. Um, so what you're observing here is a medicine wheel from the Warm Springs tribe. And these, this is a K-8 academy. Um, I, I think it was similar in the way grades are um, um, take place in the K-12 system. But these are all native kids that put this together. All we really did was lay out the equipment and they did everything with their hands. They did all of this by themselves with us just guiding. Um, and that speaks to the power of our people that we touch things, we feel things. Now what you're observing as it gets higher in elevation towards near space where it will pop, you can see their lands. And so with these visuals, they're able to see their lands, they're able to see their farms. And here you can see the ozone layer. That's the belly of birth that at least in our traditions, we think Mother Earth has a belly and this is her pregnant belly delivering us. And so this video during the solar eclipse of 2017, when grandfather and grandmother were gonna have passionate love, captured for the children how we are from the stars, how we are connected to the energy field. This ozone layer is an energy field and it's protecting us. It gives us this dense atmosphere these words that children know, and that atmosphere is called the protector. It's Father Sky. So Father Sky protects us. And so what do we do to protect Father Sky? Do we drive these big cars? Do we, do we burn a lot of things? What are we doing to protect Father Sky who is scattering these gamma rays, these X-rays, these ultraviolet rays, so that we don't get sick, so that we can be protected? And so as you see here, and um, you can stop the video anytime, Jody. as you can see here, this in itself is the representation, the amalgamation of feeling, not thinking, of feeling through something that is scientific. Our people knew how to do that. And so as we look here, we can see this beautiful exercise using a weather balloon. We can we can describe the technology, the, the frequencies. We had GPS on it, uh, global positioning, you know, satellites, et cetera, et cetera. We had, you know, uh, uh, Arduino kits, if some of you know what that's about, and, you know, all of these different technologies. And so we were able to teach them programming. Um, and when I say teach, I mean, I was able to be their uncle and talk to them about what programming was, because it's a scary word. So one of the things that we talk about is, using terminology that we know is respectful of our elders. Um, I would never go to a grand, uh, grandmother, grandfather, uh, uh, elder and say, you need to use this uh, Arduino, right? But if I say to them, there's this thing, and this thing right here, we need to tell it what to do. What do you want it to do, elder? And the elder would say, well, I want it to do blah, 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 blah. Okay, then my job, receiving the Western training is to take their teaching, their, their desire and program this thing to do what the elder has done. But to also describe to the elder, you have just programmed. You have programmed this thing because you gave me instructions and I took your instructions and I used some funny words that are not ours. And then I programmed this thing to do exactly because you are the philosopher, you are the knowledge holder, you have the wisdom. I just am a vessel to learn from you. How can I be in a better way when I reach that age? And as Isaac Jr. said, he said, you know, the rabbit turns white. So I am turning white. So maybe I'm getting there, but I don't know. But as we get, you know, closer and closer to that, my focus here is to describe how this energy field is surrounds us. It sort of protects us from these gamma rays, from these X-rays and how we as a society of indigenous intertribal peoples, uh, we already know this, uh, we already are pre-knowledged, uh, uh, if you will, on these, these concepts. It's just that now we are teaching our children these ways of knowing 
but our children sometimes are disconnected because they have these devices that they themselves are built to disconnect them from us. So this is provocative, I know, but you are speaking to a technologist and I have seen the damage that it causes in our communities when we fail to listen to our elders. So um, this is a broad piece to share with the group. Um, and the other pieces I wanna connect to the, the, the sense of electromagnetic spectrum is that, you know, um, Isaac you know, Jr., my brother talked about uh, where do you place a wigwam and a hogan and, you know, where do we put our places? You know, does it face the east um, to welcome the sun? Does it face the north? You know, these are all things that we can share together to have these conversations. And I want to share just a few more things, and I know that we need to open it up for some questions. But I want to talk a little bit about, you know, um, what it means when you are in a place that's sacred, like your lands. And what it means when we lose the opportunity to connect these stories together and stitch them together so we can be uh, in a good way. Um, and I will share this, this uh, last story with you all. Um, I, was, uh, I was fortunate enough to, to meet my sister Jody um, through my other uh, wonderful sister, Daniela, and we uh, had a beautiful experience in the camp. And I recall, and I think it's okay for me to tell this story. I recall a student whose mother um, approached me and said, you know, my, my child is of two spirits. And I listened closely. And mother said to me, not doing very well in school, not really interested, scared of math, scared of physics, scared of all of the sciences, doesn't really want to do that. And so... I, I start there because her heart and her ele electromagnetic, you know, space connected to mine for, because great spirit made it so. And so as I have this conversation with this young person, we start, to, we start talking about, you know, the experiences and, you know, the bullying, the cyber bullying, which these devices bring, the stress, the desire to not be here, the desire to be elsewhere. So within that conversation, we, we talked about the stars. We talked about the moon in, in this case and talked about the phases of the moon and such. But I think the troubling part came when uh, this young person said to me, I really hate math. I really hate it. I don't want anything to do with it. I don't even want to see it. And so what we did is I, we stepped outside for a little bit and we went to a river. It was a river moving fast, you know, just really moving. And so as we sat there, I, 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 I literally said, we're not going to learn math. We're going to talk about nature. And this young person is like, I can talk about nature. I said, great. So as we sit out there, we watch this river flow. We see these waves moving up and down. And as they move up and down, I said, you know, when it goes up, some people call that a sine wave. Is it a wave? He's like, yeah, it's waves. Well, I said, I, I think I said he, and that's not correct. Um, so this young person said, you know, yes, it's a wave. And then from there, um, the word sign came in. And, and I, we talked about the shift. So as it goes up, there's down, and then there's a little shift thing goes back up. And so we talked about the word cosine. And so it's like, okay, it's just waves. I'm like, absolutely, just name the waves. That's all you're really doing. It's up or down. He's like, Again, I made a mistake. Um, this young person said, yes. As you can tell, I'm still on a journey myself, um, pre-programmed. So, um, so we talked about that. And then I said, okay, well, great. You know, let's talk about a perfect circle. Is there such a thing? And this young person is like, uh, maybe. And so I said, well, why don't we take some time to delve into that? So to shorten the story a little bit, um, at the end of this conversation, I said, you know, what has just happened is you have just learned physics. And this young person can actually voice off a formula I had used early about frequency, which is the sine of two pi over t. This is a young person who was already in learning trig and, and, and on their way to calculus. Why? Because we teach in our ways of knowing. We teach using the stars. We teach using Mother Earth. We teach using stones, rocks, pebbles, 
ferns, all of these things our elders have taught us. So I share all of these pieces um, and, I, and I went to multiple places only because I want this conversation to be about electromagnetic spectrum that we all share, the space that we share, the love that we share, and the one that we should do so freely. And as we proceed, remember that it, this isn't about what's up here. This is about what's right on your left side and when you hold yourself. It is about the energies that we connect with the cosmos, with the star that's in our solar system. And through that, we know about gamma rays. We know about X-rays. We know about ultraviolet. We know about infrared. We know about microwave. We know about radio. And radio for us was fires. We created fires. We didn't use smoke signals. We used fires to say, you're welcomed here. Or, you know, I'm out of food. Come help me. We didn't use these as boundaries. Yes, we had inner tribal challenges. But these frequencies called radio now, We've known that for, since the beginning of cosmos. We've done that forever. And these radio waves are part of the electromagnetic spectrum, these ultraviolet rays. As my grandfather used to say, don't walk too much in the desert because you may get a type of stroke. He didn't say stroke, but in our language, it doesn't translate. It was kind of like you will become a hurt deer, but it, but it translates into you'll get like heat stroke. So all of these things, you know, grandfather's son has taught us, our elders have taught us, these devices that exist are separating our children. This pandemic has brought us together now, and now we can have an opportunity to become one in relationship with this star that really connects us together. So this business of, you know, I'm from here and I'm from there, and, and, and then this and this and that, in the end of the day, we're all connected in relation. We're all connected in true happiness if we allow our hearts to beat for each other and pray for each other. So as we continue with this, we will uh, engage in these conversations about nature. And when you hear the word physics, do not be troubled because it, we know this, it's called nature. They took those words and made them hard for us. So we ourselves are confused and think we don't know stuff. When they use math, we use the word count. There's no difference between the two. It's just a toolbox that they've created and they use their words and took away our words. So let's revitalize our, our community. Let's come together through these mediums. Let's share this, this knowledge together. And at the end of the day, whenever you are troubled, whenever you are sad, I want you to put your hands over your heart and just say three times, I love you, I love you, I love you. And close your eyes. And if you cry and if you're sad, do it but touch your heart. Your heart is the most magnetic, most powerful electrical current that is, exists anywhere in this universe, you know, within this mother earth, if you will, because you are your universe. And as we come together, let us collide universes. Let us engage each other in a good way. So um, I thank you all for listening to me. Um, if I've offended anybody or hurt anyone's feelings, I, I deeply apologize. All I wanna do is share the knowledge that I've been given, the experiences I've been giving, and I'm always happy to learn. I am more of a learner than a teacher. So if I've said something, please let me know and I will make amends in the best way and ask Great Spirit to forgive me. So hope. Thank you so much, Carlos. Um, I'd like to kind of ask, I guess, a general question, and maybe we can, we have a little bit of time. So if folks um, who are witnessing this conversation um, have question, uh, we might be able to, to ask our knowledge holders here. Um, I also wanted to just say that in this particular moment in time, um, there are some folks who can't be around kin, other kin, who can't be around their um, generational, intergenerational families at this moment in time, or their chosen families at this moment in time. So I'm very interested, and I think some of us are interested in thinking through, like with the solar eclipse and the moment of touch, you know, what, how do we, how do we extend and reach out and give care in a moment when we can't touch? or when we, what are the protective devices that we can, or the technologies that we can use 
to mimic touch in this particular moment in time because we all are feeling um, beings and we all are connected in such ways. What do the stars teach us about this moment of social isolation and, and how to touch in this moment? I guess Carlos or um, Isaac, if you have thoughts about this, um, I would be interested. Um, Isaac, you wanna you wanna share? Or you want me to share? Um, go ahead, Carlos. I'll I'll listen and I'll, I'll share after. Thanks. <laughs> so, um, in in this connection. That, that we are all interconnected and all interrelated. I will share uh, maybe a, a struggle, how's that first? Um, the first part is that we, some of us, like myself, who is highly connected to, to a silence, to, to a, a, a way of being introspective and learning. One of the things that um, you know, our sister Daniela taught us is that we're all made of stars. We're made of star matter. So we are over, the stars are already teaching us every moment of every day. One of the challenges is for me is to listen to that star matter and go introspective and ask myself those questions. For example, what do I feel? What am I feeling right now? Right now, I will share with you in to be vulnerable. I, I feel like I didn't do enough. I feel like I wasn't enough for this presentation. I feel like I didn't give enough of myself. And so I only know that because I listen to the star matter that's inside of me and I connect to it and say, no, you shared the medicine that the great spirit, the stars brought to you at this moment, this perfect moment. There will be, this moment will never be here again. Once I've, this word leaves my mouth, I will never get that back. So what, the stars teach us is to be deliberate, intentional, and introspective in that we choose our words that are connected to our heart. That is one of the big, big pieces that the stars are teaching us. The other one is because we cannot touch another human, it does not mean we cannot step outside at night and observe the night sky and look at grandmother moon. It does not mean that we cannot step outside and feel the warmth of grandfather's sun or the cold of father's sky. And those come with prayer because we ask permission to even be here because we are just, we, we, our organisms are ephemeral. At any point, we could have something happen to us. So what the stars are teaching me, I will just personalize it, is that I need to be more introspective, that I need to be so connected, that I need to share myself more with you through these mediums, whether it's digital media, whether it's a telephone, even though they're disruptors in some way, they were built so we can have this conversation. But it's listening to the star matter that's inside of me. It tells me, do not go to YouTube and watch how to, you know, whatever, I don't know, how to shine rocks or I don't know, something, right? It teaches me to be here with you. And at this moment in time, we will never get back. So with that, I share, my sense of what the stars are telling me, well, I share the stories of my grandparents and myself. I share the fact that, you know, my tree, my willow is saying goodbye to me. And so I share that with the, with the stars to say, thank you for this tree. I, I love it. I'm so grateful for it. But that only comes from the star matter. So thank you for letting me share that, Isaac. I... Thank you. Um, I think uh, I was also thinking back to a time when I was like a single parent and thinking about the kinds of protective devices that I was looking for as a single parent. And a lot of it was thinking about fire in my relationships to fire and realizing that the fire is inside of me as well and embracing the stars as kinship, as relative as lover, like all of these things, right? Because in this moment of a pandemic, we, we desire those kinds of relationalities, those relationships. So we can look to the sky as protective devices in this moment in time. And I, I think that that's 
really important to, to remember to support single parents during this particular time, during a pause, and what extending care can look like in particular ways. We do have one question um, from one of the witnesses here. So can you provide more details about how fire and radio waves are connected? I think that one's for me. Um, indeed. Um, so when, when people hear the word radio, they, there's, a, there's a particular visual they have. They think, you know, some people may think uh, AM, FM, you know, modulated frequencies and such, right? So when we think of that, we think of communication. The radio is communicating with us. It's telling us something, you know, breaking news. Today there's a, a car sale or something or other. So we listen to this information and we consume it from this apparatus. Let's just stick to that for now. And so those, those, those are, have frequencies that come into them. And those frequencies come in and then, you know, they deliver this, this sound and then we hear it and then we consume it and then we think about it, we feel it, and then we do something with it. Well, in our communities, we also use frequency. We use fires because you can see the smoke, because you can feel the heat, because you can sense it. And it was a different, well, I wouldn't say different. It's another way to communicate. So this is about communication and about communicating with others. So that is what the parallel, if you will, of how we think about these frequencies. Now, I will be even a little bit more um, direct about it. Another one is when an elk sings, can we hear that? Depending on if we have ears, you know, depending on if we have other senses. You know, when we hear a bird sing, can we hear that? Is that a frequency? Is that not a frequency? Is that a radio? Is that not a radio? So some of our traditions say that when the flight of sparrows moves, that was the optimal time to actually spear fish. And those sparrows make a particular sound. They submit a frequency. It's our radio. And so that radio told us, ah, it's time to go spear fishing in the rivers. So that, you know, the fire was more to describe how we had ways of communicating that sometimes gets lost in the translation of you know, these, these, you know, these uh, radio frequencies or microwaves or infrareds. Um, for example, when we go into a sweat lodge, are we, when we heat up rocks, what kinds of energy are we putting into it? Is it infrared? Is it a microwave? Is there something like that? What's happening to that stone? So these are the ways that our people taught us about these different ways to connect. So I, I hope that gives you a sense and I'm more than happy to continue the conversation but I wanted to share that when we think of the word radio, that's a Western word. That's a word that was created for a particular device. And that device has become synonymous with that frequency or that, you know, that way of doing things. So thanks for letting me share. So there, there are also lots of really beautiful comments um, for, for the series, um, extending appreciation um, for the, the ideas and the thoughts um, and the offerings that people are giving at this moment in time. And I just wanted to, to hold space for that, to say that, you know, we appreciate this moment and we appreciate this moment with all of the witnesses too, because uh, we have so many incredible people that are witnessing this moment and we're all sharing this together, which is incredibly special. Um, we also have some international witnesses who are also going to be um, featured in this webinar series. So Hohepa He from um, New Zealand. Um, we have Kahu also from New Zealand, Maori. Um, Wilfred Buck is um, also part of this series. Um, we have Dana, who is Dene from Navajo Nation. And of course, we have Isaac, um, De Honde, um, and yourself, Carlos, and Daniela. Um, this is part of an ongoing um, collective conversation that we all put um, care into. Um, and I'd also like to give a special shout out um, to Jody Williams and uh, Karine Hoisington and um, Priya, whose um, labor uh, we don't really see here um, in this particular, we don't really see your faces right now, but I just wanted to say, you know, it's because of 
of you and your passion and um, your knowledge also that we are able to make to be here. So thank you so much. Wow. You, you inspire me always. These are the people that are up for like three hours at night all working to prep for this particular moment. And um, we acknowledge you as knowledge holders and thank you for all of the work that you're doing so that this can happen. Um, we only have like a few more minutes left. Um, I, I, I would like to open it up again to um, Isaac, uh, Isaac Murdoch um, for some thoughts, um, some, something that you're desiring to see in the future, um, some reflections on um, a response perhaps to Carlos's offerings. And then I'll ask Carlos to do the same. Great, thank you very much, Karen. And thank you, Carlos, uh, both of you for sharing. It's, uh, it's just so beautiful. Like whenever we talk about stars, it always ends up you know, being a conversation about the heart. And I just, I just love that. I think it's, it's so fitting. You know, years ago, I remember the old people, when we would go hunting, they would cut the, the, the fat off the heart and we'd use that in, in ceremonies because they believed that the, the fat in the heart, it held certain knowledge and that fat carries knowledge. And, you know, they say the fish are stargazers and the fish will stare at the stars and the water carries that star knowledge because that water, it, of course, it, it shines, it's, the, the stars shine themselves on the water and the reflection is always there and so the water knows those stars and the fish knows those stars too and so the fish they stare up and they look at those stars and in our culture we believe that there's a hole in the sky called Bhaganogizhik and they can see the future in, inside that hole and our different animals they also look inside they look up at the sky and they get knowledge from there. And so when we eat their fat, you know, when we use their fat in ceremony, you'll often notice like where I come from, we're always using fat all the time in our ceremonies because it's filled with knowledge. The animals store that fat in, in their, or that knowledge in their fat. That's why you see it like a moose. It's got a great big, big nose. You know, it, it eats all of those medicines in the swamps. It goes to all the hard to reach places. It eats all those medicines and it stores all that knowledge in its fat. And it, it comes out in its big nose and in its heart. So when we eat that, we ingest that knowledge and that their fat becomes our fat. We become them. That knowledge that they have from up there gets transferred to us. And, you know, our brains are, are made of, pretty much made of fat. And our brains survive on the different acids of the fats that we eat. And our brains are in constant communication. We think that our brains are the ones that are kind of running everything, but it's not. It's our hearts. And so the brain sends signals to the heart, and the heart is our actual brain. And it's all based on this knowledge that we get um, from the food that we eat and from the reflection of the sky. And so I love how, how everything is so connected and it's, it's directly to the heart. So in Ojibwe photography, um, you'll have something called muzzanine, which is a picture. And you ever notice how there's a line that goes from the heart of one person or animal? It goes from their heart out of their mouth into somebody else's mouth. And then it goes down into their heart. It's because that when we, it's, it's our hearts are connecting through that sound, through that frequency that Carlos was talking about. And, you know, our people had ways to communicate through ceremony, through Jiskan, through the shaking tent, through our sweat lodge ceremonies, through, you know, our sun dances and our rain dances and our, and our fasting. And they were able to communicate with, with uh, people from long distances away. 
And so our people were really educated and super connected to this beautiful uh, blanket of communication that just thrives through everything. And they understood it because they, they understood the connection because they were, they were educated that way. And, you know, I think about today, I think about all of our children in care. I think about our old people that might be in nursing homes. I think about, you know, the moms that might be in women's shelters. Um, you know, there's lots of people that, that don't live in the bush. You know, they don't live in the forest. They're not going to be able to eat, uh, you know, the, the fat off of a moose's heart, you know. But it doesn't mean that that medicine isn't there. Because that medicine is, is in every brick, every stone, every, it's in everything. Everything that we have here comes from that, that sacred power. Everything. It's right there. And so I believe that when we, just like what Carlos says, when we, when we touch our heart, you ever notice when people are talking, they're like, they're always touching their heart all the time. It's because they're, they're trying to like actually give you their heart. They're like, here, have this. And, you know, I think that for those that are disconnected, you know, there are ways to connect to the stars. And that's by every blade of grass, every single light, you know, darkness, sound, everything connects us to this great mystery, this great power that, that exists. And, you know, there's nothing more sacred than love and caring for each other and being good to each other. You know, that's the most powerful medicine we have is, is being kind and generous and sharing with each other. And so when we reach out to those that are vulnerable or that are in situations or spaces that, that are not well, you know, it's our, even just our voice, the words that come from our heart out of our mouth and into their mouth and into their heart, you know, it can, it can help them. It can save them even. I know it saved me a few times in my life. I had a pretty rough, I had a pretty rough go there for a while. And, you know, people really helped me along through ceremony and through talking to me, but also making me realize that I am, I am valuable and I'm a part of everything. And that this beautiful, beautiful blanket of stars that hang above us is strong medicine. And that the more and more that we reach out and learn about it, the more and more we, we feel connected to it. You know, we should never spend our lives um, with our, always with our heads down. You know, this old elder from Birch Island used to tell me that. Quit putting your head down all the time. You know, you, you, have to spend some, you have to spend your time looking up. She says, how are you going to know anything if you don't look up? And so I always tell people, you know, take the time to get outside and look up. Take a look. You know, everything is there. Everywhere. It's everywhere. It's like... It's even in this, this, this apartment that I'm in. You know, it's, this magic exists in everything. And so I think that, you know, once we realize and we get the message that we're all connected and that all of our hearts are connected, that, you know, it's, we become, it becomes powerful. The human family is powerful. You know, um, my body is made out of 75% water and 25% maple syrup. And, you know, I'm going to drink water, I'm going to go pee, and my pee is going to go, the water is going to go back into the watershed. And then Jody Williams will somehow get a hold of that water, and she will drink it. And somehow, in some weird way, I become Jody Williams. And then Jody Williams, you know, transforms into a thundercloud. And then the thundercloud becomes a family of squirrels. And this family of squirrels becomes a tree. And the tree then becomes a brand new baby. Like we are so, inter like we're so connected through uh, water and light and earth that it's, it's like your mind can't even go there. And so, you know, I believe that when we put our hearts out, that when we sing our songs, that 
you know, they, they know where to go. Those sacred songs, they know, they go to the heart to reach places and, and they, they know where those dark, those dark spot, spots are and they'll go there and they'll, they'll fill those spaces up with love. And so sing your songs for our people, you know, sing your songs, dance for them, pray for them, you know, look up at the stars for them because their eyes are your eyes too. And you know, we're all this, we're all connected the same way. So thank you very much. Um, I, I, I just, I just, I, I like listening to Carlos myself. Um, so, um, Carlos, um, I really loved what you had to say and it, it was, it was touching and, you know, I just really, really appreciate you. Um, you just, you, you just make me think and you know feel and I, and I just really respect that and I, and I appreciate that and Karen I just love how you're you're such an advocate for those that can't you know see or for those that that are left out and I think that your advocacy and your you wanting to hold space for people that that don't have access is very beautiful and it makes us all think and and it makes us want to do better and to to reach those hard to reach places and to 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 make sure that that nobody gets left behind and so i just wanted to thank both of you for your awesomeness and your beautifulness i think you're both are amazing miigwech carlos i'm yes. Sure. Just a parting, uh, I know we're over the, the time and, you know, we don't think about time that way, but I wanted to just share one more time that when we talk about the stars, we are star made of stars. And as we think about that, when we were talking about our, you know, heart is 60 times um, greater in amplitude, but it's actually five 5,000 times stronger than the brain in the electromagnetic field. So consider that as you look up at the stars and you feel, allow yourself to feel that energy in the ancestors. Those are ancestors, they're talking to you. Allow them to teach you something. And as you go through this, this next day, this next week, this next day uh, of, of energies and feels, and when you feel that tension, remember to look up at the sky and ask Father Sky for forgiveness or the night sky for energy or Grandmother Moon for love uh, or for Grandfather Sun. Don't look up at Grandfather Sun. But, you know, put a gaze to uh, grandfather's son to ask for power and energy and connection. So with that, I just say, Leos and Chani Ubu, it's a great blessing to be here with you. Thank everyone for the opportunity to have these moments. And through this period, this, this pandemic, as it's called, remember that we are all interconnected and that through love, we can conquer all of these things. And through the stars, the, the love that we are given by those stars, it's okay to tell somebody you love them. It doesn't mean anything bad. It's okay to love yourself. So I ask of you, hold your heart tonight a few times and tell yourself that you love yourself because you should love yourself because great spirit, you're made of perfection. You are perfect just the way you are and those stars have aligned just for you. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for holding space in such beautiful ways. Um, <laughs> this is where I start to cry <laughs> in front of everybody. <laughs> um, so out. thank you very much. Um, <laughs> somebody's like, do it, Karen. <laughs> um, so uh, Jody. Um, maybe we could show the next, yeah. Okay, so you can access the recording um, of this uh, particular conversation and last week's conversation at this um, website. Um, and please also keep in mind sort of like really, you know, radical, radically ethical citational practices so where we are learning knowledge from to acknowledge the genealogies of love and experience that has brought that person that knowledge. 
So um, when we reference each other, when we talk, when we want to, as witnesses, carry on this knowledge, that we remember the sources of this knowledge. Just a gentle reminder for those radical relational practices um, that we do have in our communities as well. Um, so next week, um, please join us for uh, we come from the STARS webinar series number three. Um, and this features Hohepa, hi, from, um, who's Maori, Maori from New Zealand, and Dana Nez, who's uh, Diné from the Navajo Nation. And um, please register. Um, we love these moments with you. So um, we really look forward to seeing you next week. And um, thank you so much for everybody that made this happen tonight. And we love you. Um, be safe, um, look at the stars tonight, and uh, we will be joining you in that as well. So take care, everybody, and see you next week. See you.